All right. Today is Monday, December 27. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. And we start with an update of the tsunami of cancellation of flights that took place over the holiday weekend and the disruption of the travel industry in general. Well, now we're getting details about the cancellations and the number continues to go higher and higher and higher. Matter of fact, over 6,000 flights were canceled over the weekend and the cancellations continue to go on. Likewise, when we talk about cruises, cases are rising, we're seeing cruises being docked and passengers not allowed to leave. And therefore, travel stocks underperform the market today. But we have some good news after the bell because the CDC updated the quarantine guidelines if you get a case so perhaps some of your beloved politicians are holding the bag and some airlines and cruises calls and the cdc came to the rescue but anyhow the market continues to ride on the seasonality of low volume in the so-called christmas slash santa claus rally even though we front-loaded the majority of the santa claus rally before christmas now we will go over a lot of details specifically what does the phrase the path of least resistance actually means i will show you examples mechanical examples in the options market coverage likewise we're seeing a lot of overbought readings across the market and this is of course tempting a lot of bears to start fading this rally so we will go over a lot of charts and dig through the details to find out the weakest links here and the names responsible for the indices overbought readings on the shorter term charts but before we end the year we want to go over the wall of worry because it will become extremely important in 2022. We covered a lot of items. The brothel over at DC, the variant, the hawk. We talked about China last night. We have yet to talk about the situation with Russia and the implications on natural gas prices. Why do we care about the geopolitical situation when it comes to Russia and Ukraine and the tensions between the United States, the West in general versus Russia? We care because the conflict revolves around natural gas prices. And if we see escalation in the conflict, the natural gas prices will surge higher. If natural gas prices surge higher, the inflation crisis will worsen and therefore the Fed will have to become more hawkish in the upcoming year. And this will not be a good outcome for the stock market. Another element is, if the crisis spills over from a natural gas prices, which is a smaller market, by the way, to a larger market, that is the crude oil market, then we will see massive implications, not just on the market, but for the global economy as a whole. And here it is, folks, in focus tonight. The new economic cold war between the U.S. and Russia. By now, you might be aware that there is an energy crisis over at Europe. We covered this chart in this program not so long ago. Matter of fact, last week, when Dutch gas prices spike significantly higher. Well, what do you know? A few days later, right before Christmas Eve, that spike turned into a crash. We are seeing massive volatility in natural gas prices, specifically European natural gas prices, and this is just the beginning. The energy crisis over at Europe has severe implications beyond paying more for energy costs. For example, ammonia prices spiked significantly higher and this is due to the rise in natural gas prices. Ammonia prices in Western Europe have reached a 13-year high. Now, if fertilizer prices continue to surge higher over in Europe, and this will be reflected in higher food prices as farmers have to shell out more money for these fertilizer prices to produce crops. So we have an energy crisis morphing into a food price crisis. On top of that, the European energy crisis have severe implications on production and the GDP growth of the European Union. Take, for example, the aluminum output, the European aluminum output, it's being cut right now due to power price surges in that particular region. A weaker economic growth picture combined with higher inflation equals a stagflation phenomenon that many European countries have not seen in a long time. The energy crisis in Europe revolves around natural gas prices. The European Union doesn't have the means to produce their own energy, specifically natural gas, and they rely on Russian imports to supply their energy needs. The deal in the working right now is to supply Germany, one of the biggest consumers of energy in the European Union, with Russian natural gas via a new pipeline. The problem is, there are implications, geopolitical implications, where the United States of America doesn't want that pipeline to go through, even going as far as touting sanctioning the new pipeline 
line. And this conflict between the US, Germany, and Russia is becoming really interesting. And of course, Germany is caught in the middle of all of that. Germany has economic needs from Russian natural gas. On the other hand, they have an alliance, a geopolitical alliance with the United States of America. Now, the flow of natural gas to Germany has been really interesting in the last few days because the flow of gas runs from Russia all the way to Germany via the Yamal pipeline, which starts closer to Siberia and it flows all the way down, crossing Russia to Poland, Ukraine, Austria, and Germany. We have been seeing an interesting phenomenon as of late because the flow of gas has inverted. Instead of going from Russia to Germany, the flow of gas on the Yamal pipeline has been going from Germany back to Poland. As if Germany is saying, no thanks, we don't need natural gas. And this is, of course, is causing shortages. And this was the main reason behind the massive spike in European natural gas prices last week. Why are we seeing gas being turned away from Germany back to Poland? Let's start with the Russian explanation. And of course, Russian President Putin lays the blame on Germany. The Germans say there is no shortage here on deliveries from Gazprom, the Russian supplier of natural gas, which means that Germany has been turning away the supply of gas. Why? Putin says Gazprom is supplying all volumes requested under the existing contract. Putin added, Gazprom did not book this traffic as its customers. Above all, German and French companies who buy gas via this Yamal route did not put purchase requests forward. He continued to add, they turned this Yamal route into reverse from Germany to Poland. Why? Because we supply gas to Germany under long-term contracts and the price is three to four, even six to seven times cheaper on the spot. Just reselling 1 billion cubic meters, one can earn $1 billion. And of course, the German economy ministry declined to comment. In other words, Putin is accusing Germany of turning away the supply of gas and reselling those supplies back to Poland and profiting in the process. Now, here's the real reason behind rerouting the supply of gas back to Poland. And this is the start of an economic cold war. Gas prices slide as tankers head for Europe. What are they talking about here? At least 10 vessels are heading to Europe, according to ship tracking data complied by Bloomberg. Another 20 ships appear to be crossing the Atlantic, but are yet to declare their final destinations. U.S. cargoes of liquefied natural gas will help offset lower flows from Russia, Europe's top supplier. And as you can see, all of a sudden, all of these flotillas are heading from the United States all the way to the European Union, full of liquefied natural gas. These cargoes are being rerouted from Asian destinations all the way to European ones. And therefore, we saw a drop in European natural gas prices. Meanwhile, natural gas prices for Asian consumers spiked up higher by a little bit, as the demand from European consumers overshadows the demand from Asian consumers. Gas prices in Europe have surged more than sixfold this year as Russia curbed supplies just as pandemic hit economies reopened, boosting demand. Delayed maintenance work and power plant outages also contributed to the rally. Prices in Europe are 13 times higher than in the United States and the market is also trading at a rare premium to Asia, making the continent a prime destination for LNG liquefied natural gas. More US LNG will also help ease France's power crunch as countries will need to produce more electricity from gas, coal, and even oil to cope with nuclear outages. At the start of January, about 30% of France's nuclear reactor capacity will be offline. Here's another reason behind the massive drop in European natural gas prices. We talked about the geopolitics here. There were also technical reasons. Prices also dropped amid speculations. Some traders opted to close positions ahead of the holidays. And this is happening across all markets, by the way even the stock market. We're seeing a short covering rally in the stock market too. Through the festive period, limited market liquidity may spur even greater volatility. Advisor-inspired energy PLC said in a note, a lack of clarity in Russia's supplies is quote-unquote breeding bullish sentiment, while growing appetite for energy complex profit-taking adds downside potential, quote-unquote. So in other words, folks, the assumption here is the U.S. talked to allies, chiefly Germany, to turn away Russian natural gas supplies in favor of American natural gas supplies. The problem is this is not a sustainable solution. This is a band-aid that will be ripped off sooner or later. And it also adds to the geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and Russia. 
This is, in essence, an economic cold war. We are saying we're going to supply European countries with natural gas even if it costs us, so long as it hurts the Russians. And of course, we're awaiting the response from Russia and Putin, although we have talks scheduled in January between the US and Russia to come up with a solution to this crisis. And therefore, in the latest days, we've been seeing some de-escalation. For example, the removal of over 10,000 Russian troops from the Ukrainian borders. The problem is... What if we don't come up with a solution here after the January talks? In all likelihood, Putin will go ahead and invade Ukraine, and this will spike up natural gas prices and perhaps even crude oil prices significantly higher, adding more to the inflation woes globally. Putin has been playing hardball, talking tough as of late, blaming the West for the tensions with Ukraine. And if there is a war, Putin will blame the West for not coming with a resolution and an agreement with Russia. Even the former U.S. ambassador to Russia is saying that Putin is quote-unquote acting crazy over Ukraine, and it is getting scary. Putin also got agitated last week and said that Ukraine belongs to Lenin anyways. He also added, what if we set up missiles on the borders of the U.S. and Canada, or Mexico, question mark? Visibly angry, he went on to vent frustration over the idea of sovereign Ukraine, suggesting that the country actually belongs to Vladimir Lenin. Putin added, and who did California belong to? He asked, apparently referring to California being a part of Mexico prior to the Mexican-American War. Now, this is crazy talk, of course. It sounds as pre-war kind of talk. Nobody's paying attention right now, specifically in the financial markets. But this problem could escalate really quickly when we talk about the black swan that could hit the market. This could be one of those black swans. We know ahead of time that there are tensions between Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and the US. But nobody's anticipating right now or pricing in an invasion of Ukraine and the spike in natural gas prices perhaps spelling over to crude oil prices. And this is exactly what we talk about when we include Russia in the wall of worry. The Fed is already turning hawkish. You and I know the market doesn't care about fundamentals. The market doesn't care about the pandemic, fatalities, hospitalization, all that crap. The market doesn't care about geopolitical tensions, nuclear wars, the extinction of humanity. That doesn't matter. Asteroids hitting the planet. All of that doesn't matter to the stock market. What the market cares about is the cocaine. And we know that the Fed is starting to tighten the flow of cocaine to the market. Forget about the Yamal pipeline and the flow of gas. We're talking about the flow of coke from the Federal Reserve to the market. And that flow is being tightened and tapered. The market can handle tapering the assets purchasing programs, but what the market cannot handle 100% is increasing interest rates rapidly. If tensions escalate and perhaps Russia ends up invading Ukraine, then the energy crisis will not be limited to the European Union. It will spill over and touch the United States and pretty much the entire globe because a spike in natural gas prices as a result of geopolitical tensions, specifically wars, will also mean a spike in crude oil prices, which will mean higher inflation, which will push the Fed to act even more aggressively than they have intended before. A more hawkish Fed means less coke. Less coke means that the stock market will fall apart. And these are the kind of things we have to keep in mind heading into 2022. And with that out of the way, folks, let's move on to the market's coverage today, starting with the market's performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 351.82 points or a gain of 0.98%. The Nasdaq also closing in the green by 217.89 points or a gain of 1.39%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 65.40 points or a gain of 1.38%. All of the indices closing in the green at the highs of the day and look at the volume way down lower than the week before and this is the problem with these kind of rallies you have to take them with a grain of salt because they're not supported by any volume what about the sector's performance here we're not going to shame any sector of the market because all of them managed to close in the green led by number one technology capturing the gold medal. And at number two for the silver, energy. Number three for the bronze, real estate. It's a combination between the inflationary trade of energy, 
materials, industrials, and technology. When we talk about technology, we're talking about the big caps, of course. Why? Because the breadth was not that good today. Here it is, the advanced to decline ratios. NYSE, 71% advancing versus 27% declining. The NASDAQ, 48% advancing versus 50% declining. So the majority of issues in the NASDAQ were actually down today. What does that mean? The pop in the NASDAQ today was led by the big caps. On the other hand, the rally on the NYSE was more diversified because we're talking about energy moving higher, materials, industrials, even REITs moved higher today. Therefore, the sustainability of the pop in the NASDAQ is questionable. and The bad breath that we got today could be the precursor of an imminent pullback. Moving on to futures, commodities, what's going on here? Look at the pop in crude oil prices. You thought inflation is gone? Think again. You thought inflation is peaking? Think again. You thought by releasing barrels out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you solved the problem? Think again. They're going to continue to buy the dips here over and over and over again until the party is over for good, meaning the crash. Oil happens to be the last man standing, and it was the last man standing in the last crash in 07 08. Crude oil prices popped higher by over 2.5%, and Brent surging higher by almost 3.5% today. Brent will read 80, perhaps above 80, very soon. Likewise, we have pops in gasoline, heating oil prices, natural gas, all moving moving higher. What about softs? Lumber continues to move higher. The transitory inflation in lumber, of course. Likewise, OJ is rebounding higher, along with cotton futures. And we have news about cotton because the supply is nowhere to be found. Look at the chart here. In green, cotton futures at the New York exchange. In white, the March to May spread. And this is also a leading indicator for cotton futures. And the March to May spread is moving higher, meaning the cotton futures will also start to move higher. And where is the supply, you might ask? It is nowhere to be found. As you can see in the chart, in yellow, orange, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. Now, you better use those gift cards that you got in Christmas, because all of these apparel prices will start to move higher. There is a lagging reaction. When you see futures moving higher, it will take a few months before you see the impact. So next year, expect apparel prices to start to move higher, because cotton prices moved significantly higher. Back to the futures, we have declines here, led by coffee, and then we have cocoa and sugar pretty much in the flat line. What about metals? What's going on here? Gold is retreating pretty much in the flat line along with silver. Modest gains here. Platinum, modest losses, less than 1%. Likewise, palladium in the flat line. No move, major moves here in the metals market whatsoever because the US dollar was also pretty much flat for the day. The notable gainer in metals futures is copper. Copper moved higher today by almost 2%. Meats futures, live cattle, feeder cattle, lean hogs, all on the flat line, no major moves whatsoever. Grains, on the other hand, the rallying grains continues to go on. We talked about soybean yesterday. China is hoarding soybeans to fatten their hogs, and therefore soybeans across the board are moving higher, be it soybeans, be it soybean meal, soybean oil, all popping higher. Likewise, we have gains for corn, rough rice, and oats. The pullback in oats did not last for so long. On the other hand, we have losses led by wheat and canola futures. The bottom line here is transitory inflation, my ass. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume is slowly coming back to the market, specifically via options, and today the hottest table, no surprise here, Apple, with a little over 1.3 million contracts traded today, about 75% of those were calls. Notice the call to put ratio, heavily favoring calls, not just for Apple, but even for number two, Tesla, the souffle, almost 1 million contracts traded today, about 62% of those were calls. At number three, AMD. With almost 600,000 contracts traded today, about 67.5% of those were calls. Now, let's talk about what do we mean when we say the path of least resistance is higher? Everything is happening via the options market, folks. Nobody's buying stocks here. Everything is happening via options market manipulation, pure and simple. For example, take a look at Apple. These are the options for the expiration date of this upcoming Friday. We're looking at calls right now. Notice the volume versus the open interest. The open interest means those who are holding these calls and perhaps been holding these calls with the intention of holding them all the way till expiration and even with the intention of exercising these options. The volume, on the other hand, reflects the quantity traded for the day, that specific strike price, be it call or put. 
When the volume surges rapidly, exceeding the open interest, it means that we're having a tradable kind of activity, meaning they're buying these calls with no intention of holding them till expiration. They're getting in and out, rolling from one call to the next higher one. And by doing so, they're initiating a gamma squeeze in the options market. What does that mean? It means that the market maker who are selling these calls have to hedge because they're seeing massive volume on calls and the buyers are rolling up from a lower strike price to the next higher one over and over and over again. When the market maker sees this kind of process, they have to hedge. How do you hedge after selling calls or even before selling calls? You buy the underlying stock and hence the gamma squeeze. If there is a large enough volume in buying out-of-the-money calls with a shorter expiration date, the underlying stock will likely move higher absent of a resistance. Now pay attention to this. Look at the volume. For the 180, almost 200,000 contracts traded today. 182 and a half, almost 100,000 contracts. 185, almost 75,000 contracts. We're talking about Apple, of course. Contrast this with the puts. Yes, the volume is large because after all, Apple is the most traded equity in the world. But contrast these numbers for the out of the money puts 17,000, 36,000, 35,000 contracts traded for that particular strike price. Crickets, nothing. It pales in comparison with the calls. Therefore, the market maker looks at this kind of activity and says, you know what? I'm going to have to buy the underlying stock because I'm not seeing any resistance by buying puts, meaning I have to hedge this time around. Let's look at Tesla, for example. Here are the call options for Tesla. Notice the volume for the 1100 call. Over 60,000 contracts traded today. We're talking billions of dollars via options alone. With no open interest, of course. No Nobody wants to hold these calls till expiration. They're just interested in pumping the stock higher to score in these call options, the weekly call options. That's all there is. And therefore, you risk the phenomenon of a pump and dump. Where is the SEC, you might ask? The SEC is in a coma. Now contrast the calls with the puts. Unlike Apple, today, by the end of the day, we saw a surge in volume for the 1100 puts. And therefore, the market maker had to dump some shares by the end of the day. And Tesla did not close at the highs of the day when you compare it with Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and the rest of the technology sector. This is important because Tesla is the weak link here. They're buying puts. There is resistance in Tesla stock. Now, let's contrast this with NVIDIA, for example. Notice the volume. These are calls. The 305. They started with 305 in the morning. Over 21,000 contracts traded for that particular strike price. And then as the stock started to move higher, they roll up from the 305, to the 310, 315, even 320. Massive volume here. We're talking billions of dollars, folks. In notional volume, of course. Now, let's contrast this with the puts. Crickets. Nothing. No resistance whatsoever. And therefore, the path of least resistance is higher in NVIDIA. Nobody's buying puts. The market maker has to hedge by buying the underlying stock, pushing NVIDIA higher. Another one. What about Facebook, aka Meta? A lot of call option buying today. They started with 340 in the morning, and then they started to roll up. 345, 350, even 370. Massive volume for these calls. Let's contrast this with the puts. Crickets. Nothing. Not even close. Therefore, the market maker has to buy meta shares, not dump them. This is the basics of a gamma squeeze. And here's the last one. One of the largest components of the queues, the Nasdaq, Microsoft. Here are the calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday. They started by buying the 340 calls, and they continue to roll up the 342 and a half, even 345 and therefore Microsoft moved higher today. Let's contrast this activity with the puts, crickets, nothing. Therefore, no resistance whatsoever in Microsoft. When you have these gigantic stocks, Microsoft, Meta, Apple, Tesla, Nvidia moving higher, of course the market and the indices will follow through and move higher. The problem is what happens when these pumpers buying calls, weekly expiration calls, are done with the pumping? That is question number one. Question number two is, what happens when the resistance starts, when the volume comes back into the market and we start to see some selling, profit taking, fading the rally, etc., etc.? Now, keep that thought in mind because we will revisit it in the charts analysis. But for now, I got to move on and cover the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker SPY for the S&P 500. They're fading the rally here. They're buying puts, the 390 puts for the expiration date January 28th. 
8th, with the expectations that the name will pull down by more than 18% by then. They paid about 42 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. And what about the trade for the ticker FB Facebook aka Meta? They continue to buy calls here, the 365 calls for the expiration date December 31st, meaning this Friday's expiration, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about 65 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.2 million. Now bear in mind, they could have just opened this trade in the morning and closed it by the afternoon. So this is not an indicator that Facebook necessarily has to move higher for the reminder of the week. But here it is, what about the ticker IWM, the Russell 2000, what's going on here? They're buying puts, the 211 puts for the expiration date February 18th, with the expectations that the name could pull down by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about 3 bucks and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $4.6 million. What about the trade for the ticker RBLX, Roblox, one of my favorite names, a little overvalued here, but still underperforming, excuse me, overperforming the market and overperforming the rest of the high valuations, high multiple kind of names. The name moved higher today and somebody's betting for more gains to come by buying the 115 calls for the expiration date December 31st aka New Year's Eve this upcoming Friday with the expectations that Roblox could move higher by more than 9% by then. They paid about 60 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $800,000. What about the trade for the ticker MRNA Moderna? They're buying puts here expecting more pay to come. Perhaps uh, Dr. Fauci is buying those. The 215 puts for the expiration date January 21st, with the expectations that the name could pull down by more than 12.5% by then. They paid about 7 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $7 million. And what about the trade for the ticker TSLA, the souffle, the buying calls, the expiration date this upcoming Friday, December 31st, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 6%. Of course, they bought the 1,160 calls, they paid about 8 bucks and a half a piece for this particular trade, all in all spending about $5.5 million. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker AFRM, a firm? They're buying a lot of calls here, the 110 calls for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, New Year's Eve, December 31st. Notice the shorter scope for these trades. The puts have longer expiration dates, the calls with shorter expiration dates, meaning the traders are expecting gains all the way till the end of the week, but after that, perhaps the pain will resume. In this case, they bought the 110 calls and they paid about 220 bucks a piece for these particular calls, all in all spending about $7 million. They got four days till expiration with $7 million on the line. I'm moving on to the heat map analysis. What's going on here? We're back at pump the winner and dump the loser. What are we talking about when we talk about losers? Robinhood down, Didi down, Moderna down, Biotech down, the Chinese stocks down, Zoom down, Peloton down, RKK down, Roku down, Twilio down. All of these names, the losers for the year, are being sold off again. The oversold rallies that we saw last week, they're being faded right away. And we're back at pumping the winners. Who are the winners? The big caps, semiconductors, energy, materials, industrials, certain elements of banks and financials, and the consumer defensives, of course. Names like Ford are also rallying higher. All of the winners are performing okay. They're moving higher. They're buying the winners again. And the goal is to juice more profits before the end of the year. And then, of course, they dump at the beginning of the year because you want to lock in your long-term taxes. You don't want to sell right now if you bought earlier in the year etc etc and therefore in the beginning of the year we could see an interesting phenomenon of dumping the winners and buying the losers the likes of peloton rkk and those kind of names we'll see what happens when we get there but nonetheless it is an entertaining thought now let's move on to the charts starting with spy 30 minutes chart what's going on here boy they're pushing it to the limit we're getting overboard readings across the board. The 30 minutes, the 45, the hourly, the 2-hour charts, all getting overboard at this point. I'm also naming 470 as the next support because we have seen enough reactions at that point to name it as the next support. Now, this is going to pull back hard. The question is, when? Because the higher you push the chart on low volume, the harder the pullback when the volume comes back to the market. For now, it is a bullish formation. You have bull flags, a series of bull flags, and we've closed at the the highs of the day the closing candle was bullish but look at what happened last time around the closing candle was bearish it was a big pullback on thursday's closing 
And what do you know, they gapped it higher again. So could we see the inverse reaction this time around? They close at the highs of the day, and then they pull back the following day, we'll see. But for more clarity, we're visiting the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. What's going on here? The main question that I got today, why aren't the momentum indicators on the daily charts moving higher, given the fact that we had a massive rebound rally, the so-called Christmas rally? The answer is, the momentum indicators are smart. They're not buying this move higher because it came on low volume. As if the momentum indicators are saying, this rally was formed on shaky legs, and sooner or later, we will see a flush down. For now, the volume continues to recede. The momentum indicators are strengthening, yes, not by much, because the volume is down, but they are strengthening nonetheless. We are at all-time highs, and therefore we're looking for a reversal candle. We're looking for the next resistance level. For now, we don't have any. The sky's the limit. The SPY is trading at all-time highs. There are sectors within the S&P 500 that are still working. We're talking about energy, materials industrials, defensives, healthcare, even REITs. All of these inflationary sectors of the market continue to work, and therefore, the SPY is outperforming for now. Moving on to the Q's 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We have yet another gap higher, forming a bull flag. The problem is you're getting way overbought here on the 30, the hourly. This is going to be one big pullback. We have to look for resistance. Where is the next resistance? Unlike the SPY, which is trading at all time highs, when we switch to the hourly chart for the Q's, we can see we have 403 and a half. That was a breakdown candle before that has yet to be tested. We close the day at 403. 0.45. So could it be that 403 and a half is the next resistance? And here's the point I want to make, folks. This is an hourly chart for the Qs. And forgive me if the details are difficult to read, but the point I'm trying to illustrate here is look at the RSI. Every time on the hourly chart, every time we have traded at these levels, the Qs pulled back. Matter of fact, the pullbacks range from 1% to a little over 7%. The question is, how far down will we go when, not if, but when the pullback happens? For that, we have to investigate the components of the Qs. What are the names responsible for the push so far? And are they also overbought on the hourly chart or not? Let's take Apple, for example. Every time the RSI traded at these levels before, from an hourly chart perspective, that produced pullbacks. The pullbacks ranged from 1%, 1.5%, all the way to 10%. But there are certain instances, as I explained to you yesterday, where the overbought conditions were worked out via bullish consolidation, and the RSI went down and cooled off. And after that, that produced a pop higher. So there are many ways to work out the overbought conditions. We talked about that in details in last night's video. But the most common way to work out overbought conditions on any chart is a pullback, be it a gap down or a natural pullback. Where is Apple trading right now? It is trading at overbought territory, meaning we are waiting and anticipating a pullback. How far will the pullback take us? Well, that depends. We have ranges from 1.5% all the way to 10%. Here's another chart, Amazon. Look at the RSI. This is an hourly chart. Is Amazon the source of the problem here? Is Amazon overbought? Not at all. Amazon has been absent, not participating in this so-called Santa Claus rally. Now, we might have some bottom fishers here who say, you know what? There is a divergence. All the big caps are moving higher. Amazon is lagging. I'm going to buy the dip in Amazon. Have at it. It's an interesting thought. Not to me, though. Amazon is lagging for a reason. The labor cost, the input cost for the company is surging significantly higher, squeezing those profit margins. Here's another chart. Facebook, Meta. This is an hourly chart. Every time we have traded these levels before, we saw pullbacks ranging from 5 to 17.5%. The question is, how far will the next pullback take us? You can stretch this for as long as you want. The RSI is not a buy or sell indicator. The RSI is risk versus reward indicator. If you've been long meta, the risk versus reward from an RSI perspective says time to take profits. On the other hand, if you've been staying on the sidelines, waiting for a shorting opportunity, then the RSI will tell you right away what is the risk versus reward. And for now, the risk versus reward from an hourly chart perspective says you got to start initiating those shorts. When you start to see overbought readings on the RSI on longer range charts, the stronger the argument. For example, if you have overbought readings on the one minute chart, that means nothing. On the other hand, if you have 
overbought readings on the hourly chart, now we're talking. When we get to the daily chart, for example, the risk versus reward argument becomes even stronger. When we get to the weekly and you have an overbought RSI reading, the argument gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And the pullback becomes harsher and harsher. Here's another chart. What's going on here with Google? Alphabet. This is an hourly chart. Is it severely overbought from an RSI perspective? The answer is no. So Google is not the problem here. Here's another one. Microsoft. Way overbought. So we know that Microsoft was pretty much chiefly behind the rally in the queues, along with Apple, Tesla, and Facebook. And every time, and this might be really hard to read, I know that, but look at the RSI. This is an hourly chart. Every time we had overextended readings to the upside, the chart from Microsoft pulled down. And the pull down ranged from 2% all the way to almost 9%. The question is, how far will the upcoming pullback take us? Here's another one, NVIDIA. This is an hourly chart. Is NVIDIA overbought from an RSI perspective? Not yet. Getting close, but not yet. So we know NVIDIA is not the source of the problem. Matter of fact, NVIDIA got hit hard in the last few days. What about Tesla, the souffle? What's going on here? This is an hourly chart. Once again, is it overbought or not? The answer is, it is. And every time the hourly chart of Tesla traded at these levels before, from an RSI perspective, we saw pullbacks, big ones, ranging from 2.5% all the way to over 20%. The question is, how far will the upcoming pullback take us? And remember, it doesn't have to be a pullback. It could be consolidation. You're going to spot it right away. Consolidation is bullish. It means gathering of energy, working out these overbought conditions to initiate another leg higher. The point of showing you these charts is to point out the overbought conditions in certain charts behind the index. And we have to watch the behavior of how these charts are going to work out the overbought conditions in the next few days. Now, let's move on to a daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. What's going on here? We had the sloping descending line of resistance. We were expecting that the resistance will work this time around and we will see a pullback. It didn't happen. The momentum is so strong. The volume is too low. The path of least resistance is higher. They managed to break above the descending line of resistance. Of course, we have the all-time highs as the next target. The momentum indicators are getting stronger. We have a confirmation on the MACD. And here is the bullish scenario. And this is typical behavior of any chart, by the way. When you have a double bottom versus a sloping line of resistance and you break above that line, you're going to go down to revisit that line and confirm it for support. And then the chart rebounds higher. This will be the bullish scenario, of course. The bears are hoping for something different. The bears are hoping that this is a false breakout and the chart will pull down to revisit 15,975 as support and perhaps pierce below that. So the take here is watch how this chart is going to behave. It's going to pull back. When it pulls back, what will happen to that sloping line of resistance now support? Will it bounce back from that line or will it fail to bounce back? If it bounces back, then you know you're going to buy the dip because we have higher highs. If it fails to do so, then you know 15,975 will be the next stop. I will take it from there. What about the IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000? What's going on here? The Russell is not as overbought as the SPY or the Qs, and it managed to recapture 223 as support right now. We have a bull flag. The bull flag is already playing out. The problem is we're getting closer to overbought conditions again. Let's say the Russell 2000 opens up gapping higher tomorrow. You will see a gap and crap right away. The line in the sand will be 223. This is the support. So long as the chart keeps 223 as support, we're good to go. Moving on to the Dixie. What's going on here? No update at all. Still flirting with breaking 96 as support. It didn't happen yet. And therefore, we're not seeing a major move in gold or precious metals besides copper. And here is the chart of gold. What's going on here? Moving slightly higher. The setup remains bullish for now. We're waiting and waiting for the Dixie to break 96. And then you'll see the pop in gold. And silver, by the way. A lot of you ask me about silver. If gold goes higher, silver will also follow through. Now, the retail crowd prefers silver because silver is cheaper to trade. But if the institutionals start to shift to extreme safety, meaning, you know what? The Fed is going to tighten. We have a lot of problems here. Stocks are not safety anymore. They're overvalued. Bonds, not a way to go. Cryptos, that's not safety. Let's go back to gold. And we see billions of dollars flowing into the gold market. And gold will move higher. And it will be the tide that lifts all boats when we talk about precious metals, including silver. So the rally in silver depends 
on an upcoming rally for gold. If the institutions start to buy gold aggressively, silver will move higher. The assumption is the institutions, the big shots, will buy gold, the retail crowd will buy silver. And here's a chart, daily chart, for the 10-year yield. What's going on here? We have a mini baby rejection from 1.5%. The volume in the bond market, just as in the stock market, remains tame, and therefore no major move whatsoever. What about the TLT weekly chart? Any new development today? Not really, moving a little higher, still flirting with 149. One day it is support, the other day it is resistance, back and forth, back and forth. No update whatsoever here. The major move will come in the next year. And what about the VIX? For Aris chart, what's going on here? The VIX was trading higher in the morning, believe it or not, and it closed down about 1% or so. It is at support right now at around 17 and a half. Could it bounce higher or not? That remains to be the question, but we're seeing the MACD indicator on a four hours chart. Look at the columns and the histogram, the red columns. They're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. What does that mean? We are building an upcoming pop in the VIX, and an upcoming pop in the VIX will come hand in hand with a pullback in the SPY, working all of these overbought conditions in the market. Your confirmation will be when you see green impressions on the histogram of the VIX from a four hours chart perspective. Now, a lot of folks who happen to be in the bear camp, they continue to buy puts shorting the market randomly with weekly expiration, out of the money puts, and they continue to eat a pie in the face. If you want to be disciplined, wait for the VIX to pop higher again. Wait for the VIX to cross on the MACD indicator on a four hours chart to create green impressions in the histogram because that will be your green light to start shorting the market. And for the love of God, stop buying weekly put options out of the money or weekly call options out of the money. If you score in these options, the sole reason behind your profits is luck and luck is not a strategy. Moving on to Apple daily chart, what's going on here? We are almost at the target here, the descending sloping line of resistance. Apple managed to close slightly above that line. We will see if we have a pullback tomorrow or not. If that doesn't work as resistance and we continue to see call options buying for Apple and other names, then the next target will be 182. That is the next resistance. Moving on to a daily chart for Tesla, what's going on here? Unlike Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, all of these names closed at the highs of the day, Tesla, not a good close here. And I explained to you why that happened in the options market coverage. Go back and watch that. The momentum indicators are getting stronger. We have a confirmation on the MACD that the bearishness is pretty much over. And we are now starting a new bullish trend. It might be overbought for now from a 30 minutes to an hourly perspective. And that should be worked out. But on the daily, the chart has reversed the bearishness. And it is starting a new bullish momentum. Now, I want to illustrate for you the importance of these resistance lines that I have on the chart. The 9 195 and today the 1090 and a half and for that let's zoom in to a five minutes chart this line is the 1090 and a half notice how in the beginning of the day that line acted as resistance and tesla struggled to break above that point it took a little while before the break happened and then at the end of the day the same line acted as support so these numbers that i give you are important you might not see it on the daily chart but if you zoom in on a five or three minutes chart you're going to see it clearly the chart is respecting the these numbers the algos are reacting to these numbers and what about tulips btc what's going on here nothing new pretty much in the flat line but the setup remains good we have a saucer bottom followed by what it appears to be a bull flag formation now i'm playing this via coinbase we discussed this trade by the way last week I bought calls today. I got out of the position altogether. I'm not saying the coin base is not going to reach the target of 284. Perhaps it will continue to rally beyond that. But to me, this was a short term trade. I got into these calls at around 250. So I had to take profits from this trade because the expiration date was New Year's Eve. If you have a longer expiration date, January or February, then have at it. You can ride this for a little longer. But to me, it was a short term trade. The expiration date for my calls was New Year's Eve. I had to book profits today. Believe it or not, greed is not good. And lastly, AMC, what's going on here? Let's start with the bullish setup. If we place our bull glasses on, or shall we say our ape glasses on, we can see a head and shoulder formation, a reverse head and shoulder formation, I should say, which means, and this is a daily chart, by the way, which means that AMC could pop higher. Another way you could look at it is, what if this is a bull flag formation, which means AMC will move higher. There was a pop coming here. 
Now let's take the ape glasses off and place the bear glasses on. And for that, we move on to the weekly chart of AMC. What we see is a bear flag formation, a breakdown candle followed by consolidation for a few weeks. What does that mean? Sooner or later, we will see the other leg, the next shooter drop. There is another leg down coming from a weekly chart perspective. Now, what does that mean? From a daily chart perspective, you still have more room to run. From a weekly chart perspective, not so good. But remember this, the repair job in any chart starts in the shorter dated kind of charts. The 30 minutes, the hourly, the daily. So if you have a massive pop on the daily chart from the reverse head and shoulder or the bull flag, you can do a lot of repair on the weekly. And therefore, the bear flag formation in the weekly goes out of the window. Can the apes gather the momentum to push AMC's chart higher? Well, it depends. Go back to our discussion in the options market coverage. Why is NVIDIA moving higher? Why is Facebook moving higher? Why is Microsoft moving higher? They're buying call options. Well, they're also buying call options in AMC, aggressively so, out of the money, short or dated. The problem is they're buying way out of the money. And we also have resistance in AMC options. They're also buying puts. And therefore, you're not seeing that response from the market maker. They're not buying the underlying stock because the market maker looks around and says, you know what? The apes are buying way out of the money calls with a shorter expiration date. On the other hand, I'm seeing some resistance here with others buying puts closer to the money. So there is no incentive enough for me to hedge by buying AMC shares. And therefore, the advice to the apes is start buying closer to the money with higher volume. Volume. But even if you do that, how could you deal with the resistance? The traders who are buying puts aggressively so on AMC. And lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the S&P Case Chiller Home Index. This will be important. The problem is it is a lagging indicator. It will be important to the housing market. I doubt that this indicator will move the market one way or the other. If anything, it will be confirmation that inflation is white hot and the Fed has to act sooner or later. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. I think I did a good job here by explaining the options market activities and the technicals, the overbought, the oversold conditions on the charts. And now I'm tired, and therefore I have to say goodbye. This is all I got for you for now, folks. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.